uh, mention um, in times past. And I think, brothers and sisters, as we see um, more uh, taking place in the world, in the church, the question constantly arises. Why must these things be made public? Um, why must these things be dealt with the way that they are being dealt with? Shouldn't, you know, we um, kind of, you know, go through some backdoor meeting and sit down with people, do a Matthew 18. Um, and often you hear the term Matthew 18 is only generally brought up by the one who is being accused of the crime. Whatever that sin may be, um, it's always a Matthew 18, Matthew 18. Um, not it's always generally from the guilty party uh, or <clears throat> and or it comes when the person does not want to address the issue as they ought to address it. Um, I remember once someone, uh, some pastors, we had to deal with the situation and the uh, one of the response that was brought back to, to me and the others, it was, you know, someone asked, why was my name on a particular document that was sent out, you know, addressing a particular issue? And I said, you know, I said, why was my name on the document? I said, you know what? I, I said, what you should have done is you should have held up the document with some scissors and cut off all the names and say, hey, here's the document. Is the document true? You know, let's not let's not you know, let's not have a what they would call a kangaroo court and trying to figure out this and that. Let's deal with the issue. Is the is what's in the document true? Not whose name is on the document. Um, and uh, we would rather get into the what this person did or how it was done rather than dealing with what was done itself. Because if we if we if we play cat and mouse, then that gives us time to come up with an excuse to excuse why we will not address the issue. And so because of these things, um, the people are left to believe that God approves of what is taking place. Now, I mentioned this before and I'll just look at it. One, more. I'll mention it now. When you look at the book Corinthians and you look at the principle of Corinthians. As a matter of fact, let's go to first Corinthians chapter one. Um, and let's look at Paul as he dealt with the church in Corinth. All right. And we want to understand how <clears throat> he dealt with this. We're going to first Corinthians um, uh, chapter one. And let's see what the Bible says. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 10. I'm going to read verse 10 and 11. And notice what Paul says. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Verse 11. For it, had, it hath been declared unto you, of me, my brethren, by them which are where? The house of Chloe. Which are of the house of Chloe, that there are what? So in other words, Paul is about to address a church situation, not that he saw with his physical eyes. Paul is about to address a situation that he heard from others. So one would have to conclude that the whole book of First and Second Corinthians is gossip. You'd have to say it's gossip, backbiting, because Paul didn't see what happened in Corinth. He said, I heard this. Now let's go to first, let's go to chapter five. Let's go to chapter five. Again, chapter five, verse one. Chapter five, verse one. And one thing you have to always keep in mind too, keep in mind that if God did not want the problems in the church to be exposed, he never would have given us the Bible. He would have just told Moses to speak. But the fact that it was written, God knew that the written word would come into the hands of those who didn't belong to his church. And he could have only put good things in there about David. He could have only put good things about Solomon, but he put their 
evil deeds as well as their good deeds as a warning and an example uh, for his people that should come behind. Um, the thing is also we, we God calls us to be spectacles. He says a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. That means that good and bad deeds can't be hid. We're on the hill. We're a spectacle. We are the light of the world. So whether whether we're shining for God or we're shining for the devil, the world's going to see it because God says we are a theater to the world. So if we don't want the world to know what we're doing wrong, then by God's grace, we must, by his power and strength, do what's right. That's what we must do if we would not expose ourselves um, to the, the, the world. When Jesus dealt with the woman at the well, she said, should I go to Jerusalem? Jesus didn't say, you know, he said, listen, no. He said, the day is coming when you're not going to be able to go to Jerusalem. Jesus was not shy about the true condition of the church and neither should we. Um, and we're going to see in a moment. But it says, verse chapter five, verse one of first Corinthians. It says it is reported what commonly that there is fornication among you. And then so now he says it is reported commonly that there is fornication. I want us to jump down, jump down. Um, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse uh, three. Well, verse two, I read verse two. So he said there was reported commonly that there's fornication. And he said the fornication, not even so much as named among the Gentiles. Verse two, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that have done this deed might what? Be taken from among you. You didn't mourn and say, Lord, we don't want the ministry to fall into disrepute among the heathen. Lord, we don't want the, the, the ministry to be blasphemed. Lord, what shall we do with these individuals who refuse to come in line with our truth? Paul says, you have not mourned that the person who have done this should be removed from you. He said, but you're puffed up. In other words, you're trying to pretend as though it didn't happen. You want to pretend as though Rhonda doesn't exist. You want to pretend that the gay choir doesn't exist. You want to pretend that spiritual formation doesn't exist. You want to pretend that, 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 that uh, 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 the women are not burning incense in the temple. You want to pretend that all these things don't exist. He says you're puffed up, but he says this. Verse three, for verily as what? As what? Absent in body, but present in spirit, have done what already? He says, judge already, as though I were present. Paul says, I'm not even there, and I've condemned what has been reported commonly. So this idea, oh, Matthew 18, oh, we should call and try to find out why this person who, is a, who, who, who has accepted this lifestyle, who has embraced this lifestyle, Whatever the sin may be, why we need to call and find out why and get to the root of the matter. Paul says, I'm not even there and I've already judged the matter. So the question is, did, is Paul's thesis for the Corinthians based off gossip or or can we follow this this principle in dealing with things in the church? Yes, Paul says I was at I was some of the people from the house of Chloe has told me what is happening in the church. Paul says, I'm not there, but I'm writing concerning it. So now Paul is addressing the issue, not from being there. Again, even this matter, he says, I'm, I'm judging as though I were there. He says, but this person who have done this, I've judged them already. But notice what he goes on to say. Paul talks about moving the leaven from the church. And then he jumps and he says in verse nine, let me clarify, he says, let me clarify something. I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to keep company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with covetous or extortioners or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. Watch this. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a what? Brother. Brother be a fornicator. Paul says, listen, I'm not I'm not talking about Jay-Z and Beyonce. So just so we can understand, I'm not talking about 
uh, 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 Steven Spielberg. I'm not talking about President Barack Obama. I'm not talking about uh, 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 politicians. I'm not talking about these men. I'm not talking about Donald Trump. I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, Ted Cruz. I'm not talking about them. God will judge that. I'm talking about those who call themselves brothers. I'm talking about those who, who profess to be brothers in the faith. That's who I say don't keep company with. Those are the ones that I say that you ought not to be found in their assemblies. These are the individuals that I'm talking about. So we love to put much emphasis on what the world is doing. Are, are they right? No. But we like to put so much emphasis on what they're doing. And we want to just kind of kind of, uh, 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 you know, pat the hands of those who are doing it in the church. So if if like, for instance, you have a, a, a ministry called Little Light Ministries and Belt of Truth Ministries and they spend ample time and money and and great care in dissecting Superman, Batman, Marvel Comics, um, um, all of the movies, different genres, um, um, Belt of Truth. I mean, they 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 go to great lengths uh, to break down music and what it does to the mind and all these different people. And they go to great lengths to show what these things are. But what do we expect from those who participate in those things who don't know God? Do we expect anything else? Anything different from it? We don't expect anything different from when we look at uh, um, Jimi Hendrix and we look at listen to his music and what he said. We expect that. But we don't expect that when we come to church to hear Jimi Hendrix in the church. I, I mean, I, I can ex, I can I could appreciate not appreciate mercy. I can understand what Erica Badu does. I can understand ASAP Rocky. I can understand what they do and why they do it. But I don't come to church to listen to ASAP. I don't come to church to listen to Erica Badu get up and tell and try to talk her poems. And, you know, um, uh, I don't I don't go to church to hear that. So those who are in the church, Paul's saying, listen, these are the ones who are calling you, say, brother, you need to deal with this. Rather than focusing on what these men and women are not doing. That's not, that's not their focus, Paul says. Paul says they'll be judged. But I'm saying that those who are in the church who call themselves brothers, this is what needs to be dealt with. So now I want to look at a statement here in Patriarchs and Prophets. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 325. 325. All right. So now here, Moses, this is dealing with the, the sin of Mount Sinai. God comes, Moses comes down. And the interesting thing is Moses, although he grew up in Egypt, spent first 40 years of his life in Egypt, he now spends 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years in Midian. I mean, he's, he's far removed from that. When Moses wants to go back to Egypt and he says, Lord, I can't speak. He's not saying that he's dumb and he doesn't know how to speak. He's like, yeah, I don't know the language anymore. I mean, I know people that says, yes, uh, when I was in Spain, there was a lady who says, I, I, I speak good English. She said, but no one here in Spain to speak it with. So I can't speak it. She said, I can understand it. She said, she was telling, she said, when you were preaching, she said, I can understand everything you're saying. I just can't repeat it back to you because I don't have anyone to speak it with. And I said, man, that's interesting. You could actually lose your language by not speaking it. I've never known that. But so Paul, so Moses said, listen, Lord, I'm slow to speak. I can't speak Egyptian. I ain't been there in a while. I said, well, Aaron is coming. Aaron knows how to speak it. So now, but Moses, so Moses brings him out. Moses goes up into Mount Sinai. The law is spoken. He goes back. They get caught up in idolatry. God tells Moses what is happening down there. Moses is on his way back. He comes across Joshua. Joshua said, there's a war. Moses like, no, 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 ain't a war. That's dancing. That's you here. How does he know? Because God told him. So she says, she says on page 320 that Moses was overwhelmed. He had just come from the presence of God's glory. And though he had been warned of what was taking place, he was unprepared for that dreadful exhibition of degradation of Israel. God told him what was going on, but she says when he got down there, he was not expecting this. It was almost like he was like taken back like, Lord, have, what, in the, what in God's name is happening to our people? 
So now Moses comes down and he deals with it. Now, if you consider how Aaron dealt with it, Aaron dealt with it the way that many of the supporting ministries are dealing with problems today. In other words, Aaron's wanted to use diplomacy. Aaron wanted to kind of, you know, wanted to, you know, he didn't want to upset the people. So he just went along with it, even though he did not really believe it. He just kind of gave the people what they wanted and he was not going to protest against this abominable work. And she brings out that when the people said, uh, uh, these be thy gods, um, she says that Aaron was silent at this blasphemous exp um, exposition, uh, exhibition. You know, he was silent when they did this. And today, what we're seeing happening in the church, if you were to go to any supporting ministry and talk to them, they would, they would just almost pull their hair out with disgust, but they won't come publicly and they won't say nothing about it. They will tell you, Moses stuck with the church and, and when God could have gave Moses another nation, Moses didn't do it and I'm following Moses. But when Moses saw sin, Moses dealt with it. Moses didn't say, all of you mixed multitude, can I talk to you on my tent? I mean, yeah, you could get back. Yeah, just give the girl to her. And can I talk to you over here? Hey, brother, what? That ain't how Moses dealt with it. Moses came down and publicly, who was on the Lord's side? And it was, and again, it was a drastic way in which he dealt with it. And I'm sure, brothers and sisters, that some might have thought that Moses was a little beside himself. And brothers and sisters, I believe he was with hot indignation. Now, Getting back to our point, 325, watch this. It was necessary that this sin should be punished as a testimony, watch this, to surrounding nations of God's displeasure against idolatry by executing justice upon the guilty. Moses, as God's instrument, must leave, watch this, on record a solemn and public protest against their crime. So the protest on record was not only solemn, but it was what else? Public, public protests. He dealt with it. Why? As the Israelites should, in, should hereafter condemn the idolatry in Hollywood should hereafter the, the Israelites condemn the idolatry in, in, in politics. If we're going to condemn the idolatry in the world, watch this, as the Israelites should hereafter condemn the idolatry of the neighboring tribes, their enemies, would throw back upon them the charge that the people who claimed Jehovah as their God made a golden calf and worshiped it in Mount Oreb. Wait a minute. So that means when the Israelites would go among the Canaanites and they would condemn their idolatry, the people would say, wait a minute. So you mean to tell me the people, the, the other nations knew that they made this golden calf? Have mercy. So this one's secret. This was YouTube. This was Facebook. This was Twitter. You know, this was Instagram. This was WhatsApp. All any digital thing that we could think of today, they had it in principle then. So when they made that golden calf, all the tribes and the nations around knew about it. It wasn't secret. So when Moses came down, Moses didn't deal with it secretly either. Moses dealt with it in public. It was a public exhibition of God's displeasure for this idolatry. He signally dealt with it and showed that God does not approve of this blasphemous worship. God does not approve of the confusion that is in our churches. God does not approve of what is happening in our institutions. You have all, now I'm dealing with the supporting ministries now. I'm not dealing with the breath of life. I'm not dealing with um, um, hope. TV. I'm not dealing with voice of prophecy. I'm not dealing with, um, no, 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 no. I'm not dealing with, um, you know, 
I'm not dealing with connect. I'm not dealing with the ministries of the church. All right. I'm dealing with the supporting ministries. Say they believe in present truth, the three ABNs. All right. I'm dealing with those ministries, the ministries who say that they believe that God has raised them up to counteract the counterfeit. All right. I'm dealing with the, all of the supporting ministries who join ASI as they used to be self-supporting, but now they fall in the term supporting. I'm dealing with all of these little ministries, right? Who go down to GYC and, and who sell, you know, out there in the foyer. I'm, I'm dealing with those. I'm not dealing with Spectrum. I'm not dealing with uh, Adventist Review. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about and Vindicate and all of these other little ministries, right? These are the ones who believe that God has called them to stand in the gap and to stay, quote unquote, on the ship and protect the sheep. OK, these are the ones. But Moses, when he dealt with it, he dealt with it publicly, wasn't silent. OK, you have again, these supporting ministries. They talk a lot about true education. Man, we need to get back to the blueprint. We hear this, but they won't tell you what false education is. They won't say that Oakwood, Andrews, PUC, Walla Walla College, all of these institutions, uh, uh, um, all of these institutions are promoting an, an educational system that God has rejected as long with the fallen churches of Babylon. They're following a blueprint of education that God has rejected. Why won't they say that publicly? Are they trying to protect? No, they're not trying to protect. They're trying to protect their interests. But if we, but if we want to save the church, then deal with the problems publicly. And you're not trying to air out dirty laundry, but you're trying to show when the world looks, because again, you don't approve of Harvard. You don't approve of Stafford, you, uh, Stanford. You don't approve of uh, public schools, but you won't rebuke the public schools in your denomination. So why would you stand up and, and, and look at your public school system wherever you live and say, you know what, I want an exemption and I want to train my children at home because this institution, I want to be able to uphold my religious freedom. I want to be able to do this. But you won't rebuke the public school system that fall under the heading of Adventism. Let's be consistent in what we're dealing with. So it's not about airing out dirty laundry. It's not about trying just to make a YouTube video and a Facebook post and, and, and trying to uh, uh, expose people. I'm not even dealing with that. That's a moot point that put that off the table. But the reality is, is when you have an opportunity to stand before the people of God and don't pretend as though the people don't know what's going on. They see what's happening. They have access to this digital media. They know what's going on. But now that you have the pulpit, you want to just pretend as though these things has never happened. I'm not saying your whole sermon needs to be focused on this, but the reality of it is you need to let the people of know that God does not approve of the direction that men are trying to take God's people in. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about videos and I'm not even dealing with that. I'm dealing with the opportunity that you see a problem in God's church. Deal with it. I'm going to call them and I'm going to talk to I'm going to talk to Ricardo Graham as though Ricardo Graham didn't know Rhonda existed at Hollywood Church. I'm going to go and I'm a, I need to call Cavanis and see what Cavanis knew about this gay choir as though Cavanis didn't know about this gay choir. Cavanis knew about this gay choir. Um, he's a conference president in Southern California. He knew about this uh, stuff back in early 2000 because he was confronted by a pastor who had him online who said, listen, how are you permitting this? Well, they, had, they need Jesus too. That was his response back in early 2000. So it's, these things are not secret. It's not like these people don't know what's going on. So we need to stop pretending like they don't know what's going on. Let's not pretend that all of a sudden you threw some jewels in the fire and out jumped this golden calf. Oh, I don't know where that choir came from. You like like they just came out of nowhere. But here. So it says, as the Israelites should deal, should rebuke the neighbor's sins, they would point and say, but you got sins in your church. But notice it says, then, though compelled to acknowledge the disgraceful truth, Israel could point to the terrible fate of the transgressors as evidence that their sin was not sanctioned or excused. 
So it's not the fact that you don't have it in your church. What you're being able to tell the world is that God did not excuse it and God did not sanction that. How you can say that? Because I rebuked it openly. So this is the testimony. We're not trying to hide the fact that you don't have transgender and you don't have people that's no, it's not that. It's not the fact that, hey, uh, uh, pastors in your church are not going through two and three divorces and running around with their secretaries and and doing all these things. No, you're not trying to deny that. But what you are telling the world is, listen, you're right. We do have pastors who have divorced their wives and ran off with their secretaries. But guess what? They're not pastors in our churches anymore. They were pastors. And once it was known what they did, they were put out of the ministry. Are we together? So it's not about trying to pretend as though they don't exist. The thing is, when it comes to your knowledge, what do you do about it? What do you do about it? That's that's what the thing is. What do you do about it? So when we look at dealing with the issues of the church, they need to be rebuked. Now, you are you going to change Ricardo Graham and Pacific Union uh, uh, when they have a, a, a chaplain there who openly endorses Adam and Steve? You're not going to make them fire him. That, you know, the car is like, no, that we brought him here because we knew what he did. We have safe places at our school and we want him to be able to encourage. our. That's what they brought him there for. Walla Walla College, they had the gate, but they know what they're doing. But the thing is, does God approve it? Is he excusing it? And the silence of 3ABN, the silence of the supporting ministries, you would think that God is OK with it. But and so we have to praise God for ministries, for ministers who are more concerned about telling the people the truth than they are with being approved. And so when you have individuals who are willing to speak out, we need to support them, encourage them. And is it to say that every time someone does something that's right? No. When Forerunner, when he um, had the video with uh, Angus T. Jones, Angus Jones, the young man who was on Two and a Half Men, and uh, the young man basically said that you know, he told people, don't watch Two and a Half Men. It's filthy, it's whatever, whatever, whatever. The, the world didn't like that. Um, and so they came at Forerunner, came at him. What did the church do? Church says, hey, Forerunner, yeah, he's a member, but he doesn't speak on our behalf. You know, he don't speak on our behalf. So then what did Forerunner do? Forerunner came back and he apologized to Jay-Z and Beyonce and Sotomayor and President Barack Obama. And he made this long apology about, you know, he didn't want to hurt their influence. Wait a minute. I, the video was to hurt their influence because you're trying to turn people to Christ away from them. So it's going to hurt their influence. And, you know, so he made this long video of apologies to them. And but but what happens in this 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 world, this 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 climate that has been been set up, and that is. We feel as though that if we call sin of any grade wrong, then all of a sudden we we are either champions or we're kicked under or to the curve. But as long as we're talking about the pope and and, and what he's doing and his agenda, it's OK. Um, but if we say that this same agenda has crept into the Seventh Adventist Church and someone asks you about it publicly and all of a sudden you want to say, well, we need to pray. Well, why you didn't say that when they mentioned Pope Francis? I mean, why you didn't just say we need to pray? You know, this prophet said, do not make railing accusations against Roman Catholics. She says, don't rail on them. She says that many of them are going to come into the church and are going to come and are going to are going to come to the forefront when many of us walk away from the faith. So why are we railing on them? Well, I'm railing on the system. Well, tell that to a Roman Catholic that I'm just talking about your system. You're talking about them. Let's not play on words. I'm not talking about people. Well, tell that to them when they get upset. I ain't talking about you. I'm just talking about the Pope. The Pope! I'm going to kill you now. Because they believe that that's their salvation. But when it comes to God's people, we don't want to set things right. And we like to quote the spirit of prophecy when it talks about you know, we go through all this diatribe to circle the wagons to protect 
things that we know that God does not approve of. So we have to understand what and how God would have us to deal with the things that we see being dealt with. And there are many who are not going to say anything, whether privately or openly. So someone would say, well, no, you know what? I think you should deal with this in a private matter. I'll tell you what. You deal with it in a private matter and get back to me. And let me know how it went. But generally, when you want when people tell you you need to deal with it another way, I always tell people and I was talking to my wife about this the other day and I say, listen, rather than the person telling me what I should have done, show me what I should have done. Don't tell me how I should have did it. Show me how I should have did it. And then I can learn from it. But I can't learn from you telling me what I should have done. I did something. I did what I knew how to do. And what I did, I have I could find it in these books. I could find it in this Bible. What you are asking me to do, I can't find it anywhere in these sacred pages. Now, last point on this and we'll move on. Volume three of the testimonies, page 380. Volume three of the testimonies, page 380. Uh, 280, pardon me. Volume three of the testimonies, page 280, going into 281. All right. This is Elijah on Mount Carmel. Elijah on Mount Carmel addresses the people. And this kind of is going to segue us into our study when dealing with Elijah. So Mount, uh, I, I, Elijah on Mount Carmel comes to the people and he says, why halt ye between two opinions? If God is God, serve him. If Baal is Baal, serve him. And the people answered him, not a word. Now, she says this, not one, she says, not one, not one, not one in that vast assembly dared utter one word for God and show his loyalty to Jehovah. Not one. Now, I wonder, was Obadiah there? I wonder, was he there? Because now remember, Obadiah, Elijah said, go, hey, I need to go tell Ahab I'm here. He said, brother, what are you trying to do to me? Obadiah was like, come on, man, what are you trying to do to me? They didn't tell you what I did for the prophets? And you trying to get my head cut off. He was afraid. He loved God. Just like, again, it, it is because a person is silent, to some extent, it does not mean that they're not trying to live right. But what God needed now was someone who was not just concerned about living right, but someone who was concerned about doing what was right. That's what God needs. Just like in, write this down, Great Controversy, page 605. Great Controversy, 605. She says there were some who thought that by a godly life, they would be able to turn people back to the Bible. If they just live right, I'm just going to go to church. And when they get up and start dancing, I'm going to tuck myself in and I'm going to hold my head down and I'm going to show my displeasure for this music. I'm not going to move one bit. You've been there for a whole hour. It's just music, your heart palpitating. You just feel like you get a heart attack, but you're like, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to move. And, you know, and you have a, <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> and, you know, and you have, and so you, you, you participate, you go to these things, you're there, you're seeing all this stuff happening, but you're like, you know what, I'm not going to move. I'm just going to, I know he's preaching error, it's wrong, that's not true, that's not what Spirit of Prophecy says, he's misquoting the Bible, how could he do this? But I'm going to hold up the light. I'm just going to be a light. I'm just going to sit here. I'm just going to be quiet. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to live right. My skirt is going to be long. I'm going to have it. You know, when it's time for the fish fry, I'm going to bring my, 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 my veggie links. And I'm just going to, I'm going to let people know where I stand. So while they lined up for the fish, I'm going to be sitting over here with my rice, my brown rice and beans. I'm, I'm kind of making jests, but you get the point. And they think that if I just live this, it's going to cause the whole church to come back to the Bible. But in Great Controversy 605, mm -mm. she says, when the Spirit of God came upon them, they preached truth that they were reluctant to preach prior to. Because while trying to live right, they were being reluctant to say what needed to be said at that time. But she says, like Elijah, the Spirit of God came upon them and they spoke. 
Because while they were trying to live right, they were being reluctant to do what God asked them to do. Because they said, if I say that, they're going to take me off Sabbath school. If I say that, they're not going to allow me to be over the youth anymore. If I say that, I'm not going to be over person ministries anymore. If I say that, they're going to take me out of the rotation. If I say that, see what I'm saying? So they're constantly being reluctant to do what they should be doing because they believe they're being harmless as a dove. They believe they're being wise as a serpent. But there's nowhere in the Bible where they could see how God worked in those type of method, method, methods before. What happened to Micaiah when he spoke up? Now, remember the pastor said, look, hey, we already told the prophet. We already told Ahab, you know, this is this. When you come, disagree with us. He said, man, I'll, I'll say what the Lord tell him to say. Um, Micaiah, what do you think I should do? Go up. You'll prosper. You're lying. <laughs> You're lying. You're lying. I don't believe you. Tell me the truth. <laughs> he said, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne. And man, after he finished, he said, I told you he had nothing nice to say to me. And he said, listen, he said, put this man on bread and water till I get back. He said, man, if you come back, God has not spoken by me. If you come back, God has not spoken by me. Now, again, Micaiah could have kept his kept his peace. Micaiah could have stayed free. He could have, he probably was nearing retirement. He was he was close to getting his pension and he could have just, hey, just went along and just retired. But he had to speak. He was compelled. Says, you're lying. Tell the truth. And like they say, when silence replaces the truth, then silence itself becomes the lie. So.